What's Going On Seville was made possible through donations and services provided by Hollywood Theater Lab, Lighthouse Studio, Vintage Vixen. There's a big white ghost in the brain. It's always on time, it's always the same But after 35 seconds it's the same It turns over, turns over, turns over, turns over, turns Welcome to this special edition of What's Going On Seville. I'm Lana Young. And what's going on indeed? You may be wondering where I am. Well, I am standing in the beautiful Paramount Theatre on the downtown mall in Charlottesville. And the buzz that's going on behind me are the musicians of the Charlottesville Chamber Music Festival preparing for their first show today. And I get to sit down with the co-founders and the co-artistic directors, Timothy Summers and Raphael Bell. We're going to talk about the evolution of chamber music and why they chose the pieces they did, their community outreach, and why they decided to have their first concert on this particular day. You will be seeing this show weeks from now, but it's very important that I point out the significance of this day. Today is 9-11. We at What's Going On Seville and Lighthouse Studio would like all the families that were touched by 9-1-1 to know that we are thinking about them today, and we hope that you're surrounded by people that you love. This show is for you. But before we sit down with Rafe and Tim, there's a powerful message I want you to watch. It's about a little-known syndrome that causes severe epilepsy in children. Hi. On October 2nd, I'll be holding a fundraiser at Explorations Play Studio called Jump for Team Talia. I'll be there all day taking photographs of people jumping. That's right, jumping portraits. No jump ropes, no trampolines, just you in midair. A really unique way to capture your true joy. This fundraiser is in honor of Talia, the four-year-old daughter of one of my best friends. She has a rare and catastrophic form of epilepsy called Dravet Syndrome. There's currently no cure for this disease. On October 2nd in Connecticut, Talia's friends and family will be participating in a fundraiser called Steps for a Cure, while we're here in Charlottesville taking beautiful portraits of you. All proceeds from this event will go to the Dravet Syndrome Foundation, a nonprofit that channels funds into research. For those of you who cannot attend, please consider making a donation. Even a small amount can make a difference. Thanks so much, and I hope to see you on the second. Now here's a short clip made by Talia's parents showing her life with Dravet. One, two, I have seasons.
Welcome back to What's Going On Seville. I am in the presence of rock stars of the classical music world. Do you mind me calling you rock stars? That's all right. <laughs> it might not be your thing, but I think that you are the <laughs> okay. rock stars of the classical okay. music Good. world. We, they are award-winning musicians. Uh, they are Juilliard graduates. And they are basically international sensations that always come home to Charlottesville. So welcome home and welcome to the show. Thank you. We have Raphael Bell and Timothy Summers, both the co-directors and the co-founders of the Charlottesville Chamber Music Festival. So welcome to the show. Now, did you know that um, chamber musicians have special skills, both socially and musically, more, more so than a so solo uh, works or symphonic works? Yeah. Tell me about that. I want to know the difference between what it takes to be a chamber musician and everything else to do with classical music. I would say that uh, I notice it when I play in a symphonic orchestra that y you feel when you're talking with chamber musicians who, who all participate in the formation of a piece and when, we, when we're working on a quartet or a quintet, everybody participates, everybody's thinking, everybody's actively uh, creating mm -hmm. uh, the interpretation of what you're going to play. And then you can play in other larger formations when you might be more relying on a conductor and having a slightly, it's not a passive role, but a, a less active role in the... Mm, I, in right. Yeah, there are a couple of levels. I think when, when you play classical music, generally you're reading it. And then the responsibility of doing what you'd call a reading or an interpretation in an orchestra relies much more heavily on the conductor. And the people who are reading the parts uh, have much more of a job of making those particular parts sound good. Mm -hmm. And the extent to which they're reading in a larger sense is, is somewhat more limited. And then when, when we're in a small group like this, there's a, we're all reading the whole piece and all sort of playing with each other to create a more collective uh, um, sort of discussion of what the piece is about. So it's sort of like a conversation with music, would you say like it's sort of more conversational? Yeah, because like the you're pieces, working off each other. Yeah, the piece is flat on the page, and you you all need to work out how, how to um, how to uh, make it into like taking the shadow of what it is and making it into the thing that made the shadow. Mm -hmm. And you can also think the piece is flat on the page, but the piece is also the piece of music, which is something abstract in someone's head, mm -hmm. which has then been put on the page, and we have to make it back into the in a way the piece is like the living thing that that gets played, you know, the, the music, it's three-dimensional. Right. And, yeah. and, and also then you can think, I mean, your question was like, for chamber musicians, how are we different? And I mean, sometimes you encounter soloists who can be extraordinary on their own, mm -hmm. but they're always working on their own and thinking on their own. And there's something great in, in chamber music where we're, we're always being challenged. We're always being challenged by our friends, by our colleagues. And so there's, there's a lot of back and forth, and I feel like we grow that way. Hmm. Um, that's wonderful. I think it's great. That, that explains it beautifully. So uh, let's talk about the evolution of chamber music, because it, it's sort of from the Middle Ages, really, isn't it? Was, was it well, more amateur work? It's, uh, the, it's a long story. I mean, the, I think basically it begins with a division between church music and non-church music. Oh. And there was, so there's music on the chiesa and music on the camera. And so camera just means, means room, um, as opposed to church in that case. And then up until about Haydn's time, it was really very amateur for aristocrats to do at home. And then later, it became, especially with Beethoven, became uh, um, more public. Um, and uh, and Mozart it, was in there too. Did, wasn't he involved in sort of taking uh, absolutely, yeah, chamber uh, well, music to another level? Especially because he wrote such uh, such sort of, such layered. Opera. So whenever he wrote anything, it was um, it had so many layers in it that there was a lot to talk about. And the chamber music then gathered people around it. Um, same with Haydn, for sure. Um, I mean, those guys really focused what we do today. But I assume that if you talk about Middle Ages, that people have been playing folk music mm. that through the ages, and in a way, they later then we formalize what was like probably gatherings of people playing music and make it into, I mean, Schubert's gatherings and playing yeah. become... Yeah, music sort of know. between friends in Schubert's case especially. I think it's the case that right now a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, friendly spirit of folk music is being drawn upon by chamber music 
because of its acoust acoustic qualities and because of because of its uh, sense of local place, a lot of people who are interested, especially in chamber music, are drawing a lot upon folk music. Are you talking about uh, contemporary composers? Yeah, contemporary yeah. composers, like with uh, today's piece. Like um, who, for instance? Well, this David Bruce piece. The today. piece that we're going to play today. Wonderful. Um, actually, any number of pieces, especially the like the group of people the, we're playing with today from Brooklyn. They do a lot of stuff with the Silk Road group that uh, uh, that does a lot of Eastern music. Oh, wow. Yo-Yo Ma's ensemble. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so a, lo a lot of that influence is being drawn in right now into chamber music. But to say that chamber music is a particular thing is not quite right. And actually, the name is pretty general. It's just it room, is, room yeah. music. I almost feel like to bring new people in, like the younger generation, it, it, may, also, it may almost be not a turnoff, but a little intimidating. Uh, since you since you guys are sort of bringing it into the 21st century, I'd, I'd like to know if if, you're, if if the pieces that you choose reflect sort of the the evolution of technology and the society that produced it mm -hmm. in the first place. Well, I'd just like to say that in in what Tim is saying about uh, more folk music, more like the relationship between folk music and classical music being closer, for me, it, I, I think it's a great development, and I think it actually is closer to what was going on in the past with Schubert and mm. and, uh, and composers like that, where they would use folk rhythms and that the classical music was a reflection, uh, maybe a formalized reflection of uh, the, s the tunes that you would be hearing or the kinds of tunes that people would be whistling on the street perhaps. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Czech folk music, Hungarian folk music. And, and then there was a period of time in contemporary music where for me that became, there was a greater separation. That's not to say that that music isn't great, you know, doesn't have great qualities too. Um, but I'm quite drawn to the folk in yes I am too in, in classical music yeah that interests me mm -hmm. so you have out outreach programs and you go into the school system to introduce what you do your music to the kids of Charlottesville now mm -hmm. you guys went through the school system mm -hmm. in Charlottesville I want to know how you met and how this came about how the chamber music festival came about I think well, we met when my dad came to interview for a job at UVA in the art history department, and your father's in the architecture school, and so we... He's in we, the art department, too. Oh, oh sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> they were the in the same department. department. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, is that right? Yeah. Wow, I've had the wrong idea all the time. <laughs> but I knew it's not architecture. I knew it's... Uh, He's an archaeologist. Uh, archaeology. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, anyway, so yeah, that's when we met now. I was 10 years old. And okay. 10 eight. and 8. Ooh, so you've got him by two years, huh? Oh, yeah. You're the mature one. That's a very strong advantage. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, fantastic. And so how did, how did this come about? How did the chamber music... Well, we played, I mean, we, Tim was a little bit older, so we didn't always, we weren't always in the same schools. Mm -hmm. But we played together in youth orchestra, and then we played together when we were in high school. And we, I mean, we read chamber music when we were at that age. I remember the first time I played the Schubert Quintet mm -hmm. um, was with you. And um, and then we met again later when you came to Juilliard after Harvard. Yeah. Oh wow! Did you know that you were going there, or did you just meet in the halls like surprise? Oh yeah. Well, so you knew happy. I was there. Yeah. You must have oh, known I was there. Yeah. So but there were a lot of kids from our generation in Charlottesville that came through this really good music system in the schools that went on to conservatories. They went uh, to Eastman, to, to I don't know where, maybe to Cleveland, Cleveland, Indiana, Indiana, um, to Juilliard. There wow. were. So mm -hmm. Charlottesville's ba basically got Meredith talent. Wrote it. <laughs> yeah. there was a lot of talent. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was a lot of talent here, and and there was a great system, like with the university. There were good teachers at the, at the university and mm -hmm. good programs in the schools. It was a great town to, to grow up in. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we've got a few minutes left. Let me tell me how you started this festival, and then I would really love to talk about your decision to have the concert on this particular day, 9/11. Yeah, well, uh, we started actually once when Rafe was visiting, um, and I was living here and Rafe was visiting, and it was that uh, a friend of yours was working on a festival like this in North Carolina, and we got to talking about what one would be like here, and I said I thought that sounded like a good idea and we could do that, and we marshaled our resources and uh, threw it together. Um, threw it together, and tw here we are 12 years later. Still throwing. <laughs> yeah. That um, I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and and then please tell me the significance of this day, on nine eleven. Why you decided to start the concert today? Well, you know we, 
we have a pattern of when we play in September, and it's a, a pattern that gives us rehearsal times and concerts that are on Thursdays and on Sundays. And it happened that the, the first one that we would have was on today, so the question was whether to have it today. And um, we decided we just would. Um, the, when, we, when we were here uh, in 2001, um, we also had a question of whether we should cancel the concert. We had a violist in New York, Phil, who couldn't come because they were... Um, Frankfurt. He was in Frankfurt, stuck. And uh, so, uh, actually, Melissa Reardon, who's there this year, came down and played instead. And uh, we found, we delayed the concert a couple days, and uh, we found it was just a nice thing to have. Um, at that time, we were playing in Haydn Opus 20 string quartet. There are six of them. And uh, I remember we were rehearsing, and uh, we didn't really know what else to do. We were very shocked. Uh, to, shock doesn't quite cover it, but so we were sort of still rehearsing and wondering what on earth is going on. And then it became clear that it was worse and worse and worse, and eventually we stopped and co collapsed like everyone else. Oh, wow. um, that, that's the thing that I particularly remember about it. I think I was playing that. Uh, Raman, I think, was playing in the Haydn. Uh, quartet, um, and so I, they're they're just beautiful quartets, and I thought it would be excellent to continue with them uh, this year. I mean, our, the the program we have this year is not, it, or this today is not geared directly toward 9/11. I don't think it's something that's really in the realm of what we do. Okay. I think the the idea was much more that we could present things that would remind you that there are other things possible. That's wonderful. And so the uh, the program is quite bright, and um, the Gumboots is a piece that's about uh, yeah. rejuvenation and a piece that has dances that um, were inspired by the dances of um, black miners and under apartheid in South Africa, and that that are about the the human spirit and overcoming a great difficulty. So it's a perfect and match. Yeah, and it just seemed like it's a celebration. They, they become, by the end of the piece, a, a great celebration of life. Um, Wonderful. And so I think there's some reflections of 10 years ago and th that we do the same, we do a Haydn quartet from the, same, yeah. uh, from the same set. And that Melissa, who came 10 years ago for the first time, she's here to play with us again. And Brilliant. Yeah, so just, I think, there's no escaping the context of today. That's right. for sure. But I think uh, presenting some, uh, a few hours of something um, something full of other possibilities is worth the trouble. Brilliant. Well, on that note, I think we'll say goodbye and let you get to your rehearsals because okay. I know I've kept you long enough. Uh, just quickly, what is your website for viewers if they want to sort of follow your schedule? Yeah, it's uh, seavillechambermusic.org. Wonderful. And I just want to quickly <laughs> show <Mahler> chamber <laughs> their program. <laughs> Would chamber. you just move your bow down? I know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is the program that Tim's father actually painted. Right. And this is going to be, the painting is going to be auctioned off at the end of your concert series, correct? Right. So stay tuned. And we're going to watch a little bit of the rehearsal, so stick around. Thank you so much, Timothy. Thank you so much, Rafe. And can we end on a really high note, uh, please? <laughs> The highest <laughs> really? you can possibly can we do. End on That's a high dangerous. <laughs> I know. So cover your ears, everyone. <laughs> Prepare to be excited. Oh, that's so dangerous. <laughs> Come on, seriously. Are you going to be shy right in the last moment? <laughs> yeah, the cameras—they scare me. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in and spread the good word.
What's Going On Seville was made possible through donations and services provided by Hollywood Theatre Lab. Lighthouse Studio.
Vintage Vixen.